all really excited to be here to talk about social determinants. Uh, and I'm especially pleased to be part of a, a dream team of two amazing uh, physicians. How many people in the room have faced a fork in the road in their lives? Show of hands. Me too. That's why, that's why I'm up here tonight. I'm going to take you back in time for a minute. Um, imagine the year 1989. Uh, I was living in New York City. I was an undergraduate at uh, Columbia University. Seinfeld had just started. The Berlin Wall came down. And a song called It's the End of the World as We Know It was uh, a hit on the radio. But what wasn't there in 1989? No cell phones, no email, no internet. It was really kind of the end of the pre-digital age. Now, for those of us in New York City, there was something else going on. After years of uh, federal policy changes and local policy changes, the social safety net in New York City had really uh, collapsed, and we were in the midst of a full-fledged epidemic of homelessness. And I was, uh, I was young back then, and I didn't know what to do. Um, so one day, I decided to start counting, uh, counting how many people asked me for help, for money, or assistance of some kind in the 10 minutes that it took me to walk from my dormitory to campus, all of three blocks. I started counting, and I counted not five, not 10, not 20, but 35 people in need asking for help. And I resolved that day to try to do more than just stand around and walk around counting. Uh, I asked around, and I found a program at Broadway Presbyterian Church uh, that served meals and provided services to homeless people. And I began volunteering there every afternoon for the rest of uh, the time that I lived in New York. And on a busy day, we would serve about 300 people. Um, world's a lot different today than 1989. Uh, there's a lot that's almost would be unrecognizable to somebody from back then. But you know what? There's something that hasn't changed. Broadway Presbyterian Church is still there, and they're still serving 300 people on a busy day. So there's an entire segment of our society that has been left behind by all the innovation and disruption and exponential magic that's been happening everywhere. So the three of us have, have a challenge uh, to this room. Um, we have tremendous affection and respect for XMED, but our simple goal for tonight is to start harnessing the power of innovation and invention and harness that to disrupting the social determinants of health that drive healthcare outcomes to such a great degree in this country. Now, there's um, no one who knows more about the stakes or knows uh, what it's going to take to start that kind of a chain change than, uh, than Gloria Wilder. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> hey. I'm from Brooklyn, so we get kind of loud. Um, I want to talk to you guys, and I thank you guys for inviting me to be here because I, you heard, I'm a street doctor. That's what I am. That's what I went to Georgetown Medical School to be. Um, and as a street doctor, I take care of kids. I'm a pediatrician in homeless shelters or, or mobile medical units or under bridges. And I'm really concerned, as I have been for the 25 years of my career, about why I haven't been put out of business and why we still need street doctors. And what you see in this picture are some of my patients and some of the other street doctors and nutritionists. And in that picture is a medical assistant 
who almost lost her housing because she makes an income as a medical assistant, as a healthcare provider in the United States that is not enough to afford housing for her and her three children. So she actually called Child Protective Services on herself in order to secure housing for her and her family as a medical assistant. And she talks about helping her patients and having the same issues as her patients. Sometimes, as a street doctor, we see too much. There's too much going on. And when I just flew in here to San Diego, and I watched your news, and I heard about the homeless, and the fact that now in San Diego, you're going to address housing because there's a hepatitis A crisis. And I thought to myself, did we need the hepatitis A crisis to address housing? So as we look at the social determinants of health, right, and some people can argue the word determinant might be too strong, social influences, like that, I'm going to tell you, yada, yada. I don't care. <laughs> People are dying. There are real issues that we can innovate around and that we have to innovate around because the solutions we've had in our country in the past for healthcare delivery are solutions that really focused on class. Class. Our health care system is a disease maintenance system. It has very little to do with health, right? It has to do with disease management. And as soon as you get a disease in the United States, we actually give you significant services, regardless of who's paying for the services. But without the diagnosis of a disease, it's very difficult to get access to well. And well is what we all want to be. At least it's what I want to be. Like that. So for me, when I take care of my patients, it really is about reflecting what's really happening in our society. We have economic segregation in healthcare. We've had it for a long time. It shouldn't shock anybody in the room. Right? Depending on what card is in your pocket, right, you can determine what you can buy in the healthcare system. And the only form of universal health care that we have in our country, and we've had it since 1973, is the emergency room. Under legislation called EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Liability Act, which says, as a doctor, if you show up in the ER and I'm on tonight, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to treat you and I'm going to treat you. Okay? I don't have to do anything more than that, like that but you'll get that. And that's our universal health care coverage. So when we think about everybody who we know in neighborhoods, and you look at these pictures, can you tell who's the doctor? Who's the dentist? Who's the medical assistant? Who's the nutritionist in this picture? You might be surprised. But you won't be surprised by this, these facts, right? We know it. 40 million people in our country are food insecure every day. 40 million people, right? Food insecure means that they're not guaranteed to have a meal today. In our country each year, we waste $40 billion of food. We waste it, we just throw it away. I'm full, I'm done. You know, our restaurants dump it in garbage at the end of the night. This hotel, everybody will waste food that we have the highest incarceration rate of any industrialized nation. And we've thrown away so many people. There are folks who, but for transportation, they would have access to health care. But they can't get there, right? And we don't have a way 
to get it to them. We have to start talking about the impact of income in our communities. And the fact in the United States that poverty is not a natural condition in the United States. It's actually a condition that we've decided is, is acceptable. It's acceptable for some people to work 40 hours a week at a minimum wage that keeps them below the poverty level. A poverty level whose formula was written in 1963 based on the cost of food and hasn't been revised since then, even though now housing is the greatest expense for any family every month. Some of these solutions are not real difficult. Like I said, I'm from Brooklyn. I don't do anything hard, right? This is simple math. And as we all start to think about what we can do, the first thing is just to acknowledge that it's happening, that there really are families who have to get hepatitis A for us to put them in decent housing. There's other families who we spend billions of dollars each year housing them in apartments and buildings that are keeping them sick. There are children tonight who will be in the emergency room for asthma for no other reason than the public housing that they're living in. And doctors like me will tell them to keep puffing on that inhaler I remember in Washington, D.C., we were on one side of the city, there are seven academic institutions and hospitals. On the other side of the city, there's one. 47% of the children live on the side of the city where there's one hospital. It had, in the past, no pediatrics at that hospital. So as a pediatrician, I used to tell mothers whose kids were having an asthma attack, to call a cab, don't call an ambulance. And then when the cab gets you halfway across the bridge to the other side of the city, call the ambulance. Because then you will be t the baby will be taken to a pediatric hospital and will live. Why? Why do we do that here? For me, the reason why I decided to do all this is in these pictures. This is, this is Glory, I remember her. And in the background is my mother and my father. And I grew up in Brooklyn to a mom who raised us on welfare, like that with food stamps and Medicaid. My father was one of the first black men in New York to get his iron workers card. He was a welder. And that should have been enough to keep us out of poverty. But what it took for a black man at that time to get that card led my father to drinking. And he became a bum on the street. Today we would call him a homeless man struggling with addiction, but back then he was a bum. And I would see him on the train station platform as we would go to school. And we were taught never to acknowledge my father, because if people knew, they would think less of us. And my mother would work three jobs to get off welfare, and the entire time, she was called a deadbeat, because in our country at that time, it was illegal to work and be on public assistance. Gloria would get sick and have scarlet fever and use the public clinics and somewhere around six years old, I decided that just wasn't right. So families like mine are all over this country. And still we strive to come up with some solutions. We have to look at the fact that 80% of the impact of health has to do with where you live, how you live, and the environment that you grow up in. For me, the social determinants of health came clear one day when on a Saturday, because we ate all our food at school, I said, and Saturdays we didn't eat, 
My mother asked us, as she did every Saturday, to go around the neighborhood and collect pennies. This Saturday, we collected pennies, me and my brother and my sister, and we go down to the store, the local store, the Duke store. He was a local grocer on the corner. And mommy said, tell him to give us a quarter pound of bologna and a bag of bread. And we went down to Duke, and Duke was this big black man who owned this store. And I said, Duke, mommy said, give us a quarter bologna and a bag of bread. And Duke looked out at Shorty, his assistant. He said, Shorty, get her that quarter pound of bologna and that bag of bread. And, that, and as I waited for them to give us the, the food, the door to the store went busting open. And kids from the neighborhood kept running in. And they were getting chips and ice cream and peaches. And I was standing there with this bag of pennies. And I knew at that moment that all those kids would know that I was poor. They was poor too, but nobody wanted to acknowledge it. And Duke looked at me and he took his big hand over my little hand and he scooped up the bag of pennies and put it underneath the counter. And he looked at Shorty and he said, hey Shorty, get her that pound of bologna, pound of cheese, bag of bread, tain that milk, and some chips and ice cream and peaches. And now we're standing there, because I knew I had 96 cents. And Duke is pushing this big bag of groceries towards me. And I take the groceries and I'm trying to sneak out towards the door. And as I get close to the door, Duke looked at me and he said, Hey, tell your mama I said hi, and don't forget your change. And he handed me a quarter. And that quarter was the return on investment. That quarter paid for my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, my medical degree from Georgetown. And just know, that what Duke did for us that day was he shared his dignity with us. He made it not matter. And I hope that what you guys will take away from what we're gonna to talk to you about today is that you can be a Duke in the life of any kid. I'm gonna ask Lee to tell us more. Um, I want to thank you, uh, and I'm humbled to be here with Gloria and with Josh. Um, you know, clearly, I didn't grow up like Gloria. I grew up a privileged white male. And when Josh asked me what my fork in the road was, I said, well, I was privileged. I was the son of educators who took me traveling around the world, and I remember at the age of 12, in the early 80s, so that was interesting, we all go back to the 80s, visiting um, this rural village in East Africa. And I remember taking this picture of this young child who was suffering from what I would later learn was kwashiorkor, a severe form of malnutrition. Later that day, in talking with some of the village elders, I found out that this child was 10 years old. She looked like she was three or four because of the stunting from her malnutrition. And I remember from that point at the age of 12 being outraged about what I would later learn were severe health inequities globally. And years later, I had the great privilege of serving families in South Florida and Northern California as a general pediatrician and listening to their stories and addressing another health inequality the fact that in the United States, one in three young children enter kindergarten not ready to read and worked with a program, Reach Out and Read, that has scaled up and provided books and reading aloud guidance as a routine part of pediatric care to millions of children in thousands of pediatric clinics around the country. 
and most recently focusing my clinical care for the few children who are born with rare serious health conditions like this young lady who was born with congenital blindness and I was very honored when she asked me to her wake, make a wish party as her own Prince Charming. Uh, but I'm often reminded of the children that we serve by this story of Aaliyah. It was a girl I took care of in Miami. She's a four-year-old girl with preterm birth, severe intellectual disability, congenital heart disease, chronic lung disease, and a gastrostomy tube feeding. Every month, her mother contends with a dozen subspecialists, five community agencies, and care provided across three hospitals. Every day, she administers five chronic medications to Aaliyah. And she's a single mom. And like a lot of the families I serve, is it from an immigrant from Latin America with limited literacy and limited English proficiency. Here's a sample map, care map, drawn by a mother like Aaliyah with the child in the, f in the center and the family in the center of the map. And you'll notice that in the lower left-hand corner is where all the health care delivery, or as Gloria would say, the disease care delivery takes place. But really, from the perspective of a family, there are many other quadrants. There's the school in the upper left-hand corner, and community and advocacy groups, and recreation, and legal and financial and social supports. Now, this would be difficult for any one of us in this room to manage on a daily basis. But imagine being Aaliyah's mother with limited resources and limited language capabilities. What would that feel like? And so what keeps me up at night and what drives the research that myself and my colleagues do is this essential question that I hope many of you in this room will help us answer. What kind of care system do we need to meet everyone's health needs? You know, as Josh and Gloria alluded to, it said that Social factors, the sociome, determines more than 50% of your health outcomes. And to a certain extent, that's true, that our physical environment, our zip code, determines more than our genetic code. And that biology, our genome, our microbiome, our epigenome, everything that you've heard folks talk about earlier this afternoon, together with medical technology, comprise less than 40% of our health outcomes. But this view of social determinants of health is too simplistic. In fact, I think it's better for all of us to think about technology in the social context. Because the relationship between social factors and biologic factors is in fact elastic. It's not opposing, it's not a dichotomy. And in public health, we think about this simple model. And I suggest that this is a model that we can work on together. That for every condition, there is a risk. There is a risk of having that particular condition. And for every condition, there is efficacious treatment or prevention, efficacious technology. And our job is to create access to that technology for everybody who needs it. Now, that technology can be complex chemotherapy or vaccines or nutrition to a pregnant woman or reading aloud to a young child. It doesn't matter. Our social obligation is to get it to the people who need it. Let me give you an example about this elastic um, relationship. Here are two children with Down syndrome that I treated, one in Florida and one in California. Children with Down syndrome are, have a 100% genetic condition and a biologic risk for cancer. But if one of those patients of mine got cancer, their health outcomes would be most determined by their zip code namely their access to regionalized subspecialty care in Florida or California. In fact, do you know the one state where their health outcomes would be greatest if they got cancer? Might surprise you, it's right in the middle of the country, it's Texas. It's largely because of the good work of St. Jude's Hospital and providing absolutely free access to chemotherapy for those patients. I want to introduce you to three large areas of barriers to health equity that govern are health disparities research, epidemiology, public policy, and social well-being, with three examples. We know that 5% of people consume more than 50% of medical resources. These are the folks with the most intense, multi-morbid chronic diseases. And for many of them, we have the medical technology. We have care coordination and care management that works. But when we survey these individuals, including parents of young children with chronic illness, a third of them report that their children still have unmet health needs. We're not giving them the access to what they need. 
Gloria alluded to this. In the United States, one in four children lives in poverty. One in four. And we have technology that can help each and every one of those children. We have immunizations and screening and early nutrition programs and early developmental programs, but fewer than 50% of those children are getting that technology that we know works. And social well-being, this is a lot of the research that I do in health literacy. We know that more than one in three adults in the US have limited health literacy and inability to consume and use health information to meet their health needs. But we continue to provide health information on the web, in apps, and so forth, such that 80% of that information out there is too complex. And what are we doing? We're, complying, we're providing more of it. We're creating a consumer-driven health information that is too complex for most people to understand. A colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins calls this public health malpractice. This is an example of what I mean by health literacy. We delivered this question to 400 families, representative socioeconomically of the United States and four sites nationally. We asked them to dose a liquid medication for a common medication that we give to children with ear infections, and it required them to find that dose on the medication label and dose the syringe. And he guesses about what percent of families got that right. Was it 10 percent? Was it a third? It was 50%, roughly 50% of parents were not able to get this question correct. And it's not on them, it's on us to improve that. The, many of these families, by the way, had some college education, so it wasn't simply an uh, aspect of education. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Stanford, and this is something I can use your help with. We're building an innovation lab for child health equity. It has a various components. We have a health policy analytics lab where we analyze Medicaid paid claims to give advice to public policymakers at the state level. We have a health literacy lab where we're working with families in low literacy and limited English proficiency communities to redesign medication labels and to develop tools that can help with obesity prevention in the early years. And we have a digital health lab where we're creating applications that are low literacy that can help families navigate the care maps that you saw Leah's family needs to navigate. And finally, in the community, we're working on web resources that can connect individuals to the services that they need, the nutrition services, the housing services, the transportation services that they need. And so what is my message to you in my health policy research, we often talk about social justice. The fact that any bad health outcome is a tragedy, but any preventable bad outcome is unjust and quite costly. So my challenge to all of us here, let's create a public health technology culture, one that assures timely access to effective health technology for everyone at risk. This is going to require creative energies from the people in this room. Not more pediatricians or social scientists, but you, entrepreneurs, thinkers, people who are developing the technologies of the future to make sure that we marry, marry high tech with high touch to get the services to the people that need them. And so now I hand it over to Josh to, about the way forward. What's the return on investment, Josh? Excellent. You know, Gloria talked about patients. To some extent, Lee talked about populations. And we're going to end with really talking about the system and the way forward. Uh, let's look at a couple of numbers. Um, as most of you know, the US uh, spends more than any of the other 11 wealthiest nations in the world at about $10,000 per capita. Um, what are we getting for that? We have the lowest life expectancy of any of those 11. And we have the lowest quality health care. So the answer, in short, we are getting a very low ROI, Lee, uh, when you take it in a global context. Now, why is that? What's going on there? Um, the light green on this bar is the clinical spending in our country. And you'll see that, again, you know, we're spending 30% more than uh, the rest of the OECD. The dark green bar is social support 
and public health, where we're spending 30% less than our peers. I think we have a smoking gun. Um, you know, I work with large health systems all across the country developing long-term strategy. And the issue of social determinants comes up a lot when we're looking at strategies. And one of the fundamental issues that we grapple with is the issue of who. I'll have boards or CEOs of hospitals say, whose responsibility is it to improve the health outcomes of Americans? I don't really think it's the hospitals. Isn't our job to cure the very sick? I think it's a fair question. And uh, you know, to answer that one, we often go back to the source. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone know who wrote this? I know many of you swore an oath with a white coat. That's Hippocrates, uh, as in the Hippocratic Oath. Prevention is preferable to cure. I think the answer is pretty clear. Now, I'm not trying to say that no one's doing anything. Look at these amazing individuals and the kind of change that they're leading in our country. There are many, many innovators in this country. Kaiser Permanente's HEAL campaign, which is transforming the physical infrastructure uh, to make exercise available to their members. The University of Maryland's Beauty Parlor Initiative that's turning uh, beauticians into health advocates. Um, you know, the Florida hospital work that they're doing with the city of Orlando to build transitional housing for homeless populations. There's pockets of innovation everywhere, but it's fragmented, it's not scaling up, and it's not enough. So we would like to close out our session uh, with a focus on you. This is where you come in. Uh, we're going to be running a workshop tomorrow to take some of these problems and opportunities forward. We would love any and all of you to join us tomorrow. Uh, we also have a crowdsourcing site set up. There's the, uh, there's the link to it. And uh, Deloitte will also uh, kick in five bucks for everyone who finishes a survey, and it'll go to Health Leads, which is a Boston-based social determinants nonprofit. So please fill it out and attend our workshop. Um, I've been coming to XMED uh, for three years, and I always leave this conference optimistic and hopeful about the future. And I think the, three, the, the wish that the three of us have uh, f of all of you is that we can harness the potential and really unleash innovation and technology and change that you've been hearing about all day long. You're here about at the rest of the conference to help us disrupt the social determinants of health. As we mentioned before, uh, our system's at a crossroads, and it's a fundamental one, and lives are at stake. So we hope you will join us on the journey forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>